Welcome to Decentralized Future. We have a special guest with us, Ethan Richter from Market Gen, to talk about recruiting in Web3, uh, blockchain space, what it takes to be a recruiter in this space, what this new space uh, brings us for new jobs and for uh, remote employees. So, welcome, Ethan, to the pod. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Uh, you know, like you said, I, I'm with uh, Market Gen, one of the co-founders there. Uh, we do a lot of that recruiting kind of within the Web3 space. Um, because of that, we kind of have a little more of a, a special insight into you know what the market has, what people are looking for. Um, so really excited to chat about that with you guys. Uh, so Ethan, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, you arrived just on the right time because the job market out there is crazy at the moment. We will come to that. But we want to start a little bit like getting to know you better, what you do uh, in the Web3 ecosystem, in your day-to-day -day life. Let's get to know you a little bit better. Then we have great questions prepared to you. Perfect. Yeah, that sounds great. I'd love to chat about it. How is it like to run a Web3 recruiting job and what opportunities do you have for remote workers, uh, people in, in Web3 space? Let's get started with that. Perfect. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think recruiting just in general is a really fun industry. Uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of jobs where you get to kind of be, you know, on everybody's good side, right? You know, the, you're helping the client actually get the job filled right, the need done. You're also helping someone find a great opportunity. And I think that's really just amplified in that Web3 space. Um, the reason I say that is, you know, there's uh, pretty much anyone who's in that Web3 space right now, right, is there because they want to be. Um, it's not, you know, a space that's been established for years and years that people know is a, you know, a good space to do X, Y, or Z. Um, a lot of it is still kind of being built and developed as we speak. Um, and so because of that too, right, there's a lot of opportunities out there, um, but it can be a little tricky to find them, even though there are so many. It's kind of, uh, you know, if I was to tell you there's tons of diamonds, you know, in the, in the middle of the jungle in the Amazon, right, but you still have to go and find them right in the Amazon, even though they might be all over, it's still not going to be an easy thing, right? And it's kind of a similar thing to what we're seeing in Web3. Um, as far as kind of what sort of, uh, you know, opportunities are out there for people wanting to do remote work, um, I would say there's very few stuff in Web3 that isn't able to be done remotely. Uh, everything from, you know, people that are managing communities and stuff like that, you know, you can do that from home and, you know, uh, managing the online communities, um, right down to, you know, the developers or even the folks who are doing you know, the design work for the UI stuff, right? Um, pretty much all of that can be done remotely in some capacity. Uh, in fact, I'm having a hard time even really thinking of a whole lot of, you know, roles or jobs that you wouldn't be able to. So um, as far as that goes, there's just tons and tons of opportunities out there. It's just really about knowing where to look and making sure that you know, you know, when you're looking, right, uh, exactly what you're looking for. Because back to that diamond example, right? If you've never seen a diamond before, you know, what do you, what do you know the difference between that, you know, and a big old rock, right? If you've never seen it, you don't know. So you kind of have to know what you're looking for uh, and where to look. But if you do, there's opportunities aplenty, that's for sure. <laughs> Even, you know that the job market is currently crazy out there, especially with like the layoffs, uh, resigning offers from the companies, hiring freezes, because there is not much liquidity for startups expand like the old times. That's why all the companies are taking harsh measures. In the Web3 ecosystem, only publicly traded company is Coinbase. So we know the news from Coinbase that they are doing some uh, resigning offers and hiring freezes at the moment. But how do you see this ecosystem in terms of the rest of the Web3 space? Because Web2 is right now really uh, desperate. But Web3 space, do you see the same thing? Is it still like aggressively recruiting or all the Web3 companies a blockchain crypto companies are also in hiring freezes, taking it from slow side. What do you observe out there? So I think it's kind of a, a two-sided coin, right? So I think on one hand, a lot of the folks who uh, I'll call the major players, right? So you're talking Coinbase. A lot of those, you know, kind of tier of companies in that Web3 space uh, are kind of following suit with a lot of the other big companies, you know, that just in general having those hiring freezes and that sort of thing. Um, and I think the reason why is, you know, just because they are, you know, kind of slave to the, the rest of things that are happening with the market and are affected, you know, uh, a lot more than some of the other, you know, smaller startups. Uh, just as a small example, right? If your energy costs go up for your company, you know, just kind of with everything that's going on, um, if you're a small startup, you know, and you have a 10% increase in energy costs, your $100 bill might be 110, right? Versus if you're this massive company, right? Like Coinbase and you have all these different operations, right? That 10% could be millions you know um and so i think we're seeing you know kind of that uh, end of it because i'm also seeing on the other side right a lot of these scrappier startups and one of the reasons we kind of got into recruiting in that web3 space in general 
um, are finding creative ways to cut costs and you know kind of make things meet. Um, where I will say I have seen kind of the Web3 market uh, also kind of get affected by all this um, is in a lot of the startups. There's a lot of, you know, really scrappy, cool startups that we've talked to that, you know, uh, are about to be doing some really cool things in the space, but, you know, they need to get funding. And because the markets are plummeting, investors are just a little more wary. And um, there was someone we talked to recently who had uh, someone for, I want to say something nuts, like, you know, one and a half million dollars that they were ready to invest and that was right before the crypto market started the big downturn, right? And as soon as that happened, all of a sudden they pulled that and said, nope, not gonna do that anymore. Um, and I think we're seeing a lot of that where people who aren't necessarily in the Web3 space, but wanting to invest in it, are definitely getting scared off by, you know, kind of what they're seeing in the market and what they're hearing. Um, people who are bigger in that Web3 space are also being affected by some of those ripple effects. So it's kind of those folks who are just past that startup stage, um, you know, and maybe haven't gotten gigantic, right? Those are the folks that I'm seeing that are still doing all right. You know, they might have a couple things hitting them, but it's not nearly to the you know same uh, amount or same effect as some of those big giants, if you will. There is this emerging fronts in, in the blockchain space, uh, from trading to NFTs yeah. and metaverse to uh, DAOs. So like which which of these categories has a lot market when it comes to recruiting demands? Which space lies the most opportunities in your opinion? Great question. Um, so just speaking candidly on it, uh, I think the kind of best opportunities are with those well-established companies. Uh, as an example, crypto, right? If you had talked to me about Bitcoin in 2009, you know, 2005 or something, right? I would have told you, oh, that's, you know, that thing people use to, to do shady things online, right? It would have been a weird, you know, kind of thing. Fast forward to 2018, right? And all of a sudden everyone's getting, you know, all their friends and their grandma to invest, you know, and, and it's become this big mainstream thing. Um, and even though people thought it was going to you know, kind of pop or burst, right? Fast forward four years later to now, and it's become a staple of every, you know, conversation as far as markets go. We no longer have this conversation of, you know, weird, obscure crypto investments and the stock market. It's now how is this affecting both of these markets, you know, uh, and I think that a good example of this is NFTs, right? We had that big explosion with the pandemic of NFTs kind of really just being created and, you know, learned about for the first time. And we had that uh, big boom where people were selling just about anything, right, for your millions of bucks. And a lot of the, the people who were skeptical of it were making comments like, well, you know, you just bought a, a JPEG for, you know, five million dollars. And weren't necessarily understanding or the utility function right that was a lot of the, the comments you heard um but as we've kind of continued to you know flesh out that market and realize that there's crazy amounts of utility that nfts can be used for everything from you know making sure that um one of just as an example in the recruiting space right resumes on nfts you know like as a part of the blockchain right that's been something that's been talked about quite a lot and would be really neat because then it's a very unique to you you know record of what you've done and things like that um, that's just one of you know dozens and dozens examples of how we can actually use nfts everything from that to you know um kind of streamlining processes with things like getting a house mortgage or buying a car right um and all of a sudden that conversation has started to shift too and so i think because of that the spaces that are doing the absolute best uh, and have the most opportunities are the ones that have frankly just been around the longest so in my mind that's you know the the vr stuff and the ar stuff has been around since Pokemon Go and, you know, the Oculus and stuff like that, right? So those are a little more established. There can be some good, you know, kind of opportunities in there. Um, and then also to a lot of the the crypto stuff, you know, Coinbase and whatnot. Uh, those bigger companies, I think, also have a lot of opportunities just because they're no longer seen as kind of the, the shady startups, if you will. Um, we definitely have a lot of times we reach out to folks for, you know, positions and say, hey, we've got this cool opportunity with this, you know, really scrappy Web3 startup. And because it's someone they've never heard of, and they don't necessarily understand how the project could be used or what the long-term applications are, right? They get very cold feet and say, I, I don't know, I'd rather go work for Google or, you know, whatever it might be, right? Um, and so we do see a lot of that in the space. And I think that the solution to that, right, is really just as these continue to get more fleshed out and they're no longer these big, scary things, you know, we're going to see just more and more opportunities pop up uh, and more and more people being receptive to those opportunities as well. Um, so long answer short, I would say the uh, the most established crypto spaces or rather Web3 spaces um, are generally the ones that have the, the most opportunity, at least at this time. But I can see that growing, you know, uh, just day over day. 
Yeah, you think that the big companies, the more scale ups, are uh, having the big portion of the job market. Also, there are some changing job titles, also like job descriptions in, in this space. Which uh, areas uh, do you think like has the most demand? No, uh, absolutely a great question. I think that this too, uh, kind of going back to that example I used real early, where I was talking about kind of that jungle, right, and looking for the diamonds. Um, I think, you know, to my point of needing to know exactly what it is you're looking for is is kind of applicable here, where if you're wanting to do, you know, something in the NFT space, right, you definitely need different, uh, you know, kind of talents behind it than if you're going to be doing something on the blockchain space, you know, you're not going to be using maybe as many of the, you know, engineers and their solidity and that sort of stuff um, doing kind of the NFT things, right, you're going to need a lot more of those designers and, you know, kind of that. Um, so I think it really depends on which space you're going into as far as which kind of titles, you know, they're, they're looking for. Um, there definitely is a lot of overlap for sure, though. Uh, you know, we're always going to need engineers in some capacity. You're always going to need designers in some capacity. Um, the community manager role that you had mentioned, I'm definitely seeing a lot of that pop up. Um, and what's really cool about, you know, kind of these roles that I'm seeing pop up isn't even necessarily what, you know, the titles are, you know, kind of uh, looking for, things like that. A lot of it is the opportunities that people have um, to be able to kind of break into the space. Uh, one of the people that I was chatting with recently was looking to get like a community management role and that sort of thing. And so what he did in order to kind of, instead of getting a resume all together, uh, actually spent a lot of time just building up his Twitter following and building up his LinkedIn following. And basically in a year or so had built up a massive amount of followers on both and was able to leverage that into getting a director of a community management role. Um, and so I think it's really unique because, to, you know, traditionally to get a director role, particularly in something like that, right, you're looking at years and years of experience and, you know, all these different companies and having a, a big track record on your resume uh, versus some of this stuff now where if you can prove that, hey, I can make this happen, you know, here's my portfolio, if you will, whether that's as a community manager, right, you're, you're following on, you know, those various social medias um, or whether it's, you know, your design work if you're doing the design stuff, right? Uh, if you can kind of show them the portfolio, that speaks to a lot more volume than kind of throwing a resume at them, which is what we've you know, kind of traditionally seen. Um, so I think, again, it really kind of just depends on what space of Web3 you're looking to get into, uh, kind of what the big demands are, because um, they do have some pretty you know stark differences in what they're looking for. Um, but with that in mind, I think there's a lot of opportunity to break into spots that you might not have necessarily felt quite as qualified as, uh, you know, getting with a, a major company as Facebook or that sort of thing. So that'll make sense. Make total sense. Yeah, perfect. And linked to this, actually, like the titles and all these roles are one aspect that uh, this industry differentiates itself. But also there is another point that this environment from our side looks more remote working friendly because currently like all, even the tech companies like Apple calls back their employees back to the office. Even the companies that comes with a hybrid model, they enforce people to come to office at least three days a week. But in the crypto companies, it's mostly like more remote friendly from our observation. Do you think it's really the case that crypto companies recruit more uh, when you look at the numbers remotely or it's just our observation? And if it's the case, why do you think the reasons behind this are? Great question. Um, I do think if we were looking at hard numbers, right, just total number of people that were in remote work, the bigger ones are going to win just because they've got that volume. But I think if we're looking at proportionately, the Web3 space does kind of take the, uh, you know, the winning seat in that. And the reason I say that is because the people who are getting into the Web3 space, right, and the people who are working in the Web3 space are a different kind of, um, you know, different kind of person than a lot of the traditional hires that companies are, are used to. Uh, a great example is, you know, when people go out to look for, you know, these engineers, developers, whatever, that actually have some of these skills already down, they're not looking on, you know, LinkedIn as much. They're looking on things that were traditionally meant as, you know, kind of like gaming IM channels like Discord. And uh, I think the reason why is because, you know, the person who grew up and spent a lot of time on his computer and started you know, modding his games when he was like 12, 13 years old, right? And that sparked his interest into what can I do using this computer, right? And those are the guys that eventually started, you know, either designing their own stuff or creating their own mods or just wanting to, to learn more about coding in general. And that ultimately kind of uh, transpired into them having these skill sets that a lot of these, you know, other folks may not have. Um, so I think you're kind of looking at a, you know, two-sided piece where on one end, 
the actual employees, right, are more used to working in front of that computer. That's where they're comfortable. You know, they've never needed to to go somewhere, right, to go and, and create that code or write those mods before. So to, you know, go into an office to do that doesn't really seem to make sense to them. And, you know, I think the people who are running a lot of these Web3 companies, right, are also very uh, you know, knowledgeable of that and realizing, hey, I'm not finding these guys on LinkedIn, right, because they that's not really what they care about, right? I'm finding them on Discord because that's what they care about. They're gamers, you know, they're, you know, just tech people in general that want to chat with their tech people using, you know, some of these kind of alternate channels. Um, and I think when you're looking at kind of that whole picture and seeing these people are hanging out in alternate places, right? Well, that means you need to offer something that's kind of alternate or out of the norm as well, right? To get their attention. Um, this actually, believe it or not, is a big reason why we started moving into the Web3 space just as a company. We had um, kind of talked in the early days about, you know, what we wanted to do. And part of the recruiting piece we wanted to do was make sure that we're getting people sent to like future facing companies. Um, originally, we had kind of started in the early days of the pandemic. And we wanted to try and get like financial education info out to people and things like that. And, you know, we had kind of pivoted into the recruiting side. Um, but when we made that pivot, we decided there's so many people we know that we've been making resumes for, right? And helping out to get new jobs who worked for major, major companies, big players, right? Um, that you would never expect them to do these big giant mass layoffs, but the pandemic happened, right? A lot of people kind of, you know, freaked out company wise and tons of people were out of work. And we just said, Hey, you know, if, if there's a lot of these old companies, right. That aren't willing to move towards the future and say, Hey, we have the ability to work from home now. Right. But they're just straight up saying, we're not going to do it that's a problem, right? You know, what if this other, you know, another pandemic happened in two, three years, right? And we're kind of back to square one versus the company that built the infrastructure to make remote working, you know, make sense. Um, I know that there's lots of concerns about, you know, kind of the remote working and how effective it is. You know, I know that uh, some bigger players have recently said, you know, well, I know what I said before, but come on back now uh, and things like that. But I think that like anything, you know, it's, it's Rome wasn't built in a day and there's a lot of things to, working from home that we're just now discovering, you know, at most companies have been doing it for like, what, two, three years now, like tops for these ones that just converted it. And, you know, a lot of people are expecting to somehow nail that formula, right? In that short span of time. But, you know, it's it's a lot more complex than just saying, here's a computer, get to work, right? So I think as we, you know, continue to have more of those companies do that, not only will it be more effective, um, but we'll also see just kind of more of those opportunities, you know, pop up in general. Um, but no, great question. And that's actually, believe it or not, uh, a huge reason of why we were kind of diving into the Web3 space to begin with. Yeah, maybe because lots of companies were born during COVID in terms of the like Web3 space. Yep. They immediately by nature started working remotely. So it's easier to it's adapt indeed. It's um, a lot easier to, to the point than yeah. when you're trying to move there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. It Elon doesn't believe, believe that. Um, like he, yep. he, like he takes he takes their employees to, uh, you you will you will work in the office, Tesla, right. because we are building the next wave of like electric cars. And I do think there's, you know, industries that you know have an easier time or a harder time doing that. One of the reasons I think that, you know, Elon isn't having quite as easy of a time doing it is because his stuff is uh, a lot of manufacturing. You know, yeah, they're an electric car company, mm -hmm. right? But at the end of the day, it's huge amounts of manufacturing. You do need a certain number of people on the work floor to, you know, operate those machines and everything else, right? We haven't invented quite enough autonomy to where we can just have that, you know, work on its own, right? So I think that it definitely uh, boils down a little bit to that as well. I think that a company like Twitter, though, right? If Elon ends up buying Twitter and, and tries to make the same case, right, then it doesn't really make as much sense to me because... I yeah. should be able to do everything I need to from here, right? And if for whatever reason we're having trouble getting a hold of X, Y, and Z to, to actually have the meeting we need or whatever that looks like, or if people aren't being as productive, you know, maybe that's a bigger concern about who you've got in those roles or how you're conducting those meetings as opposed to just saying, oh, the whole system doesn't work, right? Um, because the truth is not everybody's great at remote work. You know, it took me a, a while to kind of get into it and the ebb and flow and going, okay, you're at home, right? But you need to be focusing on X, Y, or Z because it's, you know, we're comfortable in our homes. There can be distractions. Um, but I think, you know, exactly right. If we're trying to move to that versus if we were created in that, you know, work from home environment, it definitely is a lot different there too. So I think there's a, a lot of nuance to it that isn't always talked about. Yeah. Also, he had to lay off a lot of people. So what he did,
basically creating an environment and let the natural selection do the work. So if you can't come to the office, you are fired, uh, which is not a bad sign for Tesla, like it's doing economically bad, so we lay off, need to lay off the people. Instead, a little bit of framing it like they didn't come to office, that's why we had to lay them off and made some money out of it on the way. Right, yeah, you know, you can kind of control the narrative away. And, you know, uh, Elon, uh, love him or hate him, the one thing I will say is he's, you know, real good at uh, doing the marketing and, and writing a narrative, right? That's one of his superpowers. Yep. And, uh, you know, I think yeah. that you're exactly right. We see a lot of that and a lot of, you know, him kind of, part of it too is a control piece, right? It's, are you going to listen to me? You know, you may be the, the number one guy I've got in my company, right? But if you don't listen to me, you're out, you know? And so I think there's some element of that too where, you know, it's it's making sure that the company that you're running, right, is being, you know, listening to the exact things you're asking and that you can make these sort of requests, right? Because if all of a sudden you say, hey, I'd really like if you guys come back to work and no one does, right? In his mind, maybe he's thinking, well, what if I tell him I really want him to do this and no one does it, right? So he kind of has to do a little bit of that, kind of that fear of God, if you will, in him as well. So um, no, but I think you're definitely right. I think it also is uh, definitely partly to control kind of the narrative of, why those changes are happening too i think it, it all comes down to the goals of the companies if you're working on a uh, rocket science if you're building a, a spaceship that's one thing let's transition to uh more of to towards our audience and uh, our audience ma majority of our audience uh is from turkey um and it's like how, how do you envision developing countries uh, like Turkey, uh, finding remote working opportunities in, in Web3 and uh, what are recruiters looking at? I think it's a great question. Um, one of the things that gets a little tricky is not all Web3 companies, right, are open to necessarily having workers that are abroad. So that can be kind of number one that, you know, the first hurdle you need to jump over. Um, but with that being said, uh, I'll be the first to say that most of the crypto talent and Web3 talent, and I'm being candid about this, isn't in the U.S., you know, if we were looking at, you know, a, a pie chart, right, I would say 10 to at max 30 percent, right, of the you know Web3 talent really mm. being here already. Um, a lot of it, you know, is actually in places like India and spots that, you know, like you said, are developing countries, you know, Turkey, that sort of thing. Um, and I think the reason why is because for a long time, you know, we had been doing a lot of outsourcing of tech things, right, to other places that were still developing and things like that. And I think because of that, we have, you know, kind of consequently or not consequently, uh, but incidentally, right, built a, a tech community or like, you know, a tech forward kind of culture there, right? If everyone's doing IT stuff, all of a sudden, it's not a weird thing to talk about IT stuff, right? Versus if I'm, you know, sitting here working in banking, right, then no one's gonna, you know, none of my coworkers want to chat about IT stuff for the new IT project to have, you know, going on. Um, so I think it's kind of an interesting mix because most of that talent is in those spaces, right? And uh, I think it's just a matter of getting kind of a lot of the companies that are already well established in the U.S. to open up a bit more and say, hey, you know, we're going to think less about where you are, right, and more about what you do. Um, I think, too, that this is another one of the spots that's only going to continue to grow kind of in the Web3 space because, you know, to your point um, earlier, I think that Web3, if I was to summarize, you know, kind of the, the goal of it, right, um, well, a lot of people call it kind of the next evolution of the Internet, which I wholeheartedly agree with, but I think a lot of it too, right, is being able to work physically in digital places. And the reason I say that, right, is, you know, a lot of people talk about, well, if I don't have someone that I can sit right next to and say this, this and that, right, is, is where we need to change, then I don't know how I'm going to work with them. Well, once we get VR going, right, and you can throw on a headset, sit down right next to them, right, even if they're 500 miles, you know, 10,000 miles, whatever it might be away, and you can plop down next to them and say, here, here, and here is what I need that conversation is no longer really relevant. So I think that, you know, we're going to continue to see that shift as well. As far as, you know, kind of the current market and trying to get opportunities, you know, within that, um, I think this, you know, really kind of boils down into making sure that you're hyper-focused on what it is you're looking to break into. If your real desire, right, is to go do all the blockchain stuff, right, go out and look before you start looking for these jobs, right, really look out into what those you know um, blockchain companies need is it solidity that you need to make sure you've got a really strong grasp of you know if you're doing nfts right do they want to see a portfolio of work you've already done you know things like that um and then once you have that dialed in just doing a really focused outreach you know on the places that the companies might be right that the candidates traditionally aren't like linkedin and that sort of thing 
um, and being able to, you know, not just hit apply on all those jobs, right? But to also see, oh, okay, this person's the hiring manager, right? Let me go ahead and message them directly and say, hey, you know, uh, I'm I'm from Turkey, right? I have a real strong knowledge of Solidity. I'd absolutely love to be involved in this project. Um, do you have anything that you could tell me that you guys are, you know, looking for that I can make sure I you have a strong understanding of or any advice? And and people like that because not only are you saying I've got the base skills you need and I'm interested, right? But you're on top of that. You're also saying, you know, I care about this. This is, you know, passionate to me. I care about it so much that I reached out. I didn't just wait for you to, you know, talk to me. I came and talked to you and said, hey, let me do this. Um, so I think part of it too is being proactive once you've done a lot of that kind of, uh, you know, ground building or that pre-research into whatever field it is you're wanting to get into. Um, because again, the talent is is out there. And I think that we are, doing a disservice to ourselves and our companies by not, you know, utilizing it, frankly. Yeah. The method you shared is like gold because it directly uh, gives people a practical advice to really uh, go learn solidity, to develop the skills, reach people, uh, share their desires with you. But this is also like a two-way street. They need to develop some, themselves. They need to reach the right people, but also as recruiters like you needs to reach these people and you said that uh, for example before linkedin is not relevant anymore it's really a different set of contexts that's not really providing the need for uh, web3 space so what's your secret sauce to find the right candidates you mentioned discord for example uh, that a lot of people are hanging out there so you can really find some talent there but what are your tips and tricks as a recruiter to find real talent so we can maybe help our audience to increase their presence in these environments. Yeah, you bet. Um, I think that, you know, if you're on the side looking for candidates, my number one piece of advice would be, you know, to use the outlets that weren't traditionally used. Uh, a great example I love to talk about is early on, we actually did some work with TikTok influencers. Um, and I know a lot of people, you know, think of TikTok is just kind of like, you know, the, the new Instagram or, you know, a goofy app that people just kind of used to waste time. But there are a lot of people that actually follow, you know, influencers in various financial spaces or Web3 spaces. And when they do that, right, they're not just saying, I like this, right? But they're saying, I like this so much that I'm using this, you know, entertainment app that shows me silly, goofy, you know, you know what do you call it? Like kind of base level entertainment, right? And I'm using that to learn about this and change the algorithm to show me this stuff. So I'm not just interested in it, right? But I'm really interested. I'd, I'd like this to even eat up my free time you know um and so i think that there is definitely opportunities like that where you can go and partner with these influencers and you know it might cost you a few hundred bucks or a thousand bucks or whatever but if they make a video talking about you know the cool opportunities you have and there's someone who has been in the web3 space you know talking about how to get involved you know and how to learn things like solidity or you know maybe even just explaining what web3 and the blockchain stuff is right all of a sudden you're attacking a very 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 targeted audience with someone that they've chosen, you know, to kind of follow and listen to, um, to consume their free time, right, for this additional learning. And so it becomes really effective because somehow you've managed to become kind of the teacher, right, and a targeted ad and an opportunity all kind of rolled into one. And I think there's a lot of different outlets like that, you know, TikTok being one of them, Discord being another great one, right? If you find the servers where these companies are hanging out, right, and you're a candidate, and you're just asking questions in the servers, hey, how do I get into this? Hey, this is what I'm doing, you know, and it's really, yeah, you know, I think it's really exciting. Does anyone know, you know, a place where I could use this practically, right? And a lot of those communities are very helpful. Uh, by far the, the coolest thing about the Web3 community that I've found is that everyone is extremely friendly and wants to help out. Um, you know, a lot of our you know, page growth and stuff like that came from folks supporting and sharing and things like that in a community that we didn't necessarily really expect to, to blow up in at first, right? But it really came from that good place of, hey, these guys are helping people, so we wanna help them. And it's definitely the same kind of situation, right? Um, so if you're a, a client looking for candidates, maybe try some of that atypical stuff with the younger crowd that you maybe didn't think of, because those are the guys that, you know, like I said, we're doing that modding of their video games, right? That have that skill set. A lot of them are still on the younger side. Um, or if you're you know, a candidate looking for a role, right? You can either kind of cut the the line and try looking where the company is a lot of them are looking that isn't working like linkedin because if that's where they're searching and you're the only one standing there right then you're going to get noticed and you can still reach out directly to them in that you know capacity as well um, but also using the places where people do hang out to help further yourself and your education you know there's a lot you can learn just by asking questions on a discord server that 
you may not have known, you know, by just looking things up online. Yeah, well, if you have some TikToks that you loved producing, feel free to share with us and we are going to embed it somewhere on the screen so people can see and get inspired a little bit. Also, discover your TikTok account with this guys as well. Love it. Yeah, no, I'll be sure to send some along. I know we've got uh, a guy who has some influencers in the space, so I can see about getting you connected with him too. But yeah, no, that'd be great. So I think that TikTok, especially a lot of times when I've told this story, people have really kind of been like, really? You know, no way. And I, I want to say we did something nuts, like, you know, we got 500 resumes for people to looking into break into tech sales um, just yeah. from like one influencer, you know, that had started to get a decent amount of traction, just giving us a lot of, you know, the folks that were looking at his stuff. Um, and that's, you know, even just a small fraction of what he has overall, right? It was 500 out of the 20,000 plus, you know, people that are following him all the time. Um, and so it doesn't take a, a massive account, right, to start getting a little bit of traction if you're looking for, you know, and, and I won't be, you know, saying that every single one of those resumes is, you know, pure gold and, and the best candidate you've ever come across, but the want is there, right? People aren't going to find this obscure guy on TikTok and then jump through all these hoops to get their resume out to it, right, if they're not interested. That just, it's a lot of extra time and work, right, if for something you don't really care about. Um, so I think that even if, you know, the experience may not be there quite as much, the passion about these subjects is because it's literally what they're choosing to do with that free time. That's amazing. Like TikTok. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. So let's stay with the, in perspective of uh, job seekers. In Web2, like the, the last movement of uh, this personal branding uh, was huge. Like everyone was uh, working, working on their personal branding, creating content. How is it going in Web3 space? Um, is the Barney Stinson way uh, is still still active? Uh, like create a website for yourself, uh, create a, per a strong personal branding, still in Web3 space. Follow-up question to that. How is CVs uh, changed in this space? No, great questions. Um, I think first and foremost kind of getting into you know the nitty-gritty right from the candidate side um i think that there's just a lot of times where you know personal branding i have a bit of a love-hate relationship with i think that it's very very effective for the right fields and for the right kinds of candidates but i think there's a lot of folks who you know i, I think if we redefined what personal branding was it would help a lot right because a lot of people kind of just get it in their head that it's trying to become an influencer in some capacity or just you know, gather a huge amount of followers on these various social media channels. And depending on what your role is, right, that could be highly effective. If you're a, a wanting a community manager role, then personal branding might be everything because it might be the way that you can show, hey, I'm able to manage my own community that was under my own name, right? If I can do this for myself, I can do this for you. Um, you know, or if you're someone who's designing things and doing a lot of NFT stuff, right? Uh, people are going to want to see that portfolio. They're going to have something that they can click through. And so making that website and putting, you know, different links to all different work or projects that you've been on and stuff like that, um, kind of as your CV to me is very, very valid for some of those roles where it gets tricky, right? Is if I'm someone that's like an engineer, right? Then I could do a personal brand all day long and people could follow my page. I could have 10,000, you know, or a million followers, whatever it might be. Um, I could even make that website literate with all sorts of relevant stuff but it really won't help me a whole lot when i go to get that job because at the end of the day all the people are really looking for in that role right it's not design work so it's not something you can physically see quite as much it's not the community aspect of that so even though you might be a real cool guy right doesn't necessarily mean you could code quite as well and so those more traditional cvs and stuff right they become a lot more relevant again so i think that Definitely, there is a use case for this. And I think really depending on what you're doing, it can be really powerful. Um, and I think the original idea behind the personal brand is that, you know, when you're leaving stuff, right? Let's say I worked for Google for 10 years, right? As a design worker, you know, just drawing up all sorts of cool stuff. And then I leave that and I'm going to look for another job. Well, now the only value that I really have, right? As far as what I can show people and what I can say, hey, look at me, I'm worth something, right? Is that 10 years experience, with the prior employee, it's not even really my, you know, kind of value. It's what value I provided for somebody else, um, which, you know, I think there is a use case for as well. But I think the original idea was kind of if you do need to leave a role or leave a job that you won't be left high and dry because you still have this community to fall back on that you can leverage and use in all sorts of cool ways. Like, you know, even just sending out a tweet that says, hey, you know, who has a, a good job that I can maybe get into, right? If you've got a, a huge following, then you might find that job pretty quickly or, you know, have uh, kind of cool networking opportunities you wouldn't have had normally that 
get you to in an even better role. Um, and so I do think that there is a, a use case for it, but I think we need to stop like positioning it as kind of the influencer end and kind of this big scramble to just amass that, you know, big follower number, because that might not ultimately be the thing that helps you the most, you know, in that. Um, as far as CBs kind of being relevant and stuff, uh, yes, I do think that they are, and I think that they will continue to be for a long time, but I think how we look at them and frame them is going to start to become different as well. Um, one thing that I've noticed is kind of doing the, the tech stuff, right? Because we've done did a couple other industries before as we're kind of doing stuff. And I noticed for things like healthcare, right? Very traditional resumes where I worked most recently, you know, what the job role was and the stuff that I had kind of done there, right? The job before that, the job before that, the job before that. What I'm seeing with all these tech resumes, right? Is the first block is almost always what languages, you know, programming languages I'm competent in. And, you know, stuff like mm -hmm. that leading immediately with what you can do, right? Because, you know, in those roles, that's really what they care about. If you can't do the, the coding language that they have for, you know, their project, then they got to teach you and everything else. And, and that becomes worth 10 times, right? Uh, what the actual, you know, where you worked does. So I think that we'll definitely see a shift there. And I think too, if we start utilizing, you know, NFT technology and stuff like that um, for resumes and stuff, I think that'll also kind of change the game a little bit because we'll be able to really allocate achievements and things that you've done and languages you know in something really comprehensive, you know, in kind of a digital format that you aren't always needing to constantly update because it's kind of updating for you in some capacity, right? As you continue to do more work and the information gets passed along, but it's also very relative to just you, right? If it's in your wallet and it's your resume, unless you're willing to give that wallet ID to someone else to take a competency, uh, competency test and, you know, a various programming language, right? It, which is a kind of a risky deal. If you're, you know, not willing to do that, then for sure it was you that knows that language and they can say with confidence, this guy knows the stuff I'm looking for. Um, and depending on how it's broken down to, right? Maybe there's a little expandable section that says programming languages, right? Instead of having to litter all those on that summary part of the page. Um, so I think we'll see them evolve and change. But I think still for a long time in the near future, um, CBs and stuff are going to be relevant. Um, and then kind of back to your first question, I do think personal branding can be quite effective. You just have to make sure kind of like when you're looking at the roles, right, that you know why you're building that personal brand, right? Um, it's it's not just enough anymore to build a generic personal brand of, hey, I'm Ethan, right? It needs to be, hey, I'm Ethan and I do X, Y, Z, right? Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I'm at with those. Uh, like I said, a bit of a, a love-hate relationship with some of the personal branding stuff. So CVs as NFTs are coming up. They, uh, you know, between you me and the fence post, I've definitely heard some talks about it. Um, I don't know too much about the project, but I know that is something that uh, I've spoken with a few people about. Um, don't know if that'll be in five years, you know, or next year, who, who really knows there. But uh, I think that is going to, we're going to see kind of that change with a lot of stuff. I think that you go to school and you get a degree right and you get a bachelor's degree or something like that that could very well be something they put uh, as an nft on kind of your personal little chain right it's kind of proof that you did it um as opposed to just throwing it on a resume you know and, and little things like that uh you know mortgage documents and you know the deed to your house proving that it's your house even if somehow those documents got lost in a fire or you know so i think that um you know we are going to see a lot of cool uses for nfts coming up in the near future that do a lot of that stuff too right you know, this was like truly inspirational i think our audience is gonna love it it's full of practical knowledge and theory everything all packed up together but for this wisdom like of course they will initially listen to our podcast but also they need to uh apply for a job maybe they want to post a job how they can reach you find you anywhere so they can benefit from your help and also yeah find re follow your advices on twitter or somewhere please feel free to share anywhere they can find you perfect yeah uh, i am on twitter albeit uh, that's something where newer i've been breaking into so followers aren't that wild yet but uh feel free to follow me on there um if you're looking for a website just market gen recruiting is a great spot to just kind of take a peek um see about what we're about if we have any open roles right they're going to be listed there um, and I'm very open to if uh, anyone wants to reach out to me, you know, on LinkedIn directly, uh, just Ethan Richter on there. Um, you can definitely find me and I'm usually pretty easy to get a hold of. So always happy to chat and, you know, see if there's uh, something we can do for you, either whether that's filling a role, right, or, or finding you a good place to work. So definitely don't hesitate. This was really fruitful and I hope uh, everyone enjoyed this, this conversation. So, yeah, thanks, Ethan. And um, I guess I'll see you 
we will see you in the next video, next podcast. Thank you. That sounds great. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It was a, it was a good time. <laughs> All right. Thanks for Subscribe. listening, everyone. Take care. See you next time. Subscribe.